is AI that can diagnose what's making you sick. Really the solution to cure not just our aches and pains, but also spiraling healthcare costs and a shortage of doctors. Well, IBM seems to think it could be, and they've teamed up with Medgate, who run Europe's largest telemedicine center. CEO of Medgate, Dr. Andy Fisher, tells us more. Thank you so much for being with us today, Andy. So you are developing this technology with IBM. Uh, are we talking about a type of AI doctor? It's kind of an AI doctor, yes. It's, it's uh, what we call the chatbot, uh, based on AI. So what we're doing with IBM is creating a symptom checker that does the first step that a doctor does as well, starting with the diagnosis, deciding what's the right place to go afterwards. How does it work? It's based actually on our data that, that we have been collecting throughout the last 18 years of uh, doing telemedicine in Switzerland. So it's based around on around 7.5 million data points. Uh, and what we are doing is we are doing to, we are analyzing this data and putting this data in a machine that the machine tri triage patient. So it's deciding it does where... Does it triage? It does a triage, right. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, but how, but how does it work actually? I mean, uh, is there a set of questions by an automated voice? I mean, walk me through what that would be like. Yes, it asks you symptoms. So, so you would type in your symptoms in the app. So for example, headache, and then the app would uh, ask next, next relevant question to decide what is the next uh, thing you would have to do. So it, dis it, it, qu it questions you, where, when did, did the headache start? Do you have a fever? Uh, do you have other symptoms, for example? And after around seven to eight questions, it decides what's the next step to do. So the first step is the app? First step is the app. Got it. And then it, it identifies whether these symptoms would be of a high, or a patient with these symptoms would profit a lot from a teleconsultation or not. Because you don't want patients to call in to teleconsultation doctor if you already know that they're not going to profit. So those patients you would like to directly route to um, a specialist or to a GP. So that's actually the, how, the whole idea behind this, to just select those patients really profiting from a teleconsultation. Part of the strategy after the chat box then is this idea of a mini clinic. Walk me through how this works. I'll put it like this. Now, now we have been talking about telemedicine. In telemedicine, we can treat around 50% of all the patients on the phone. 50% we have to refer. Mm -hmm. The reason why we refer, most of the times, are the little things. We miss a lab, we miss somebody looks in the eye, we miss an ear, we miss maybe a stethoscope somewhere, an ECG. <laughs> so little things. So um, what we have been doing with the mini clinic is actually we apply mini clinics where the patients are, close to the patients, we let them operate not only not with doctors but with nurses. And patients show up in the mini clinic and it's the nurse doing the diagnosis, much, much cheaper than a, than a doctor. And we have the nurse collecting all the data. It's data where you need somebody physically being in contact with the patient because you need to put stethoscope on, you need to watch in the eye, take the blood test, etc. So you need a person, but it's not a doctor, it's a nurse. She takes all the, uh, the tests and then the doctor is not coming in physically like he would or she would normally through the door, uh, doctor steps in by, via video consultation. And this technically expands our diagnostic scope of telemedical application because we have a lot of data gathered by this nurse at mm -hmm. the patient's end. That's strategically what we're doing. Okay, so where does this fit into the puzzle? I mean, is this not connected then to the chat box? Or is this like a next yeah, step Yeah, it's connected to the, chat? to the chat bot. The chat bot decides whether this problem can be solved purely telemedically, okay. so it appoints a teleconsultation, or it decides whether this problem needs already a lab test, so the system already knows we will need a lab test, so we directly refer to a mini clinic. So these mini clinics are in operation? They are in operation. There are two actually uh, operating now since a year, in uh, Basel one and in Solothurn, the other one, and now we're right in the process to, to roll out in Switzerland. Okay. Well, how crucial has IBM's input been here in your project? It has been very crucial because uh, the, uh, the problem we had to solve was very tricky because the, the key question is when you, when you triage, it's not only medical aspects you have to consider. It's not only 
literature based. How high is the fever? What are the core symptoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of the decisions doctor take they are based on context information, such as where is the patient, or how nervous is the patient, or what's the time. You'll not find any of these informations in textbooks. You will only find these informations in historical data on what you have been doing. So this was the crucial thing we would have to solve. We, to come up with a data-driven system that not only is based on medical data points, but also on contextual data points. And this is actually what IBM system really solved. IBM, I mean, IBM has been in telemedicine before, but it's the first time they're on like the, what we call the, the front-end AI. It's new territory for them, right? So how, how, more, how advanced are you compared to other players in the market with this? I think it, when it comes to the question we want to solve, uh, we are very advanced because uh, kind of we are coming from another corner. We, we are coming from the medical service provider trying to solve a problem. And most of our competitors, the technology providers, producing a problem and then they apply it to a problem. Uh, that's the big difference we are in. We really had an economical problem in our organization that we had too many patients calling in, we couldn't find the resources to treat all the patients calling in. And we realized that we have a lot of patients calling in, seeking for telemedical advice, we couldn't treat because they, had, they suffered from problems you can't treat telemedically. So we lost a lot of like efforts. What? Just give me an example. Of for example, like. if you have a broken leg. I mean, it's, that's an obvious thing. Huh? I'll give you another example. If um, you have... Um, Little kid with 40 degrees fever in the Swiss Alps at three in the morning. Difficult thing to treat telemedically because it could be a meningitis. You have to be very careful. You have to refer this patient to a university hospital, for example. Mm -hmm. The same kid, 10 in the morning at Paradeplatz in Zurich in the middle of a city, 10 minutes from a university hospital away, could be a telecare because you just recall the parents an hour later and check whether the fever increased or not. Yes. So that's, that's, the, that, that's the major difference. And this makes a lot of an economical impact because the kid in the Alps, you will have to drive down, maybe call the emergency. You, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of money you are going to save. So earlier you mentioned the building up of this database and, um, and the question is always privacy issues. How do, how do you work around those? Yeah, it's, um, in this project we have two data security or privacy aspects. A, we have the privacy aspect we have to follow in Switzerland because we're under Swiss federal law, mm -hmm. so one thing. Mm -hmm. Other thing, we have IBM with uh, internal uh, data security uh, limitations mm -hmm. and we follow both regulations. So this, uh, this leads to the fact that we have been push, putting a lot of efforts into privacy aspects because, I mean, it's obvious as soon as you start um, not only researching, but producing products that are, that are data-based, you have to be very, very careful. How are you going to use this data and to respect privacy? Now, it's a growing market, telemedicine, and you were among the first to see the potential and also to link it up with health insurers. How do you see the role of the health insurers um, in terms of this technology you're developing? It, it depends a little bit on the country you're in. In these countries where health insurers play a dominant role in financing healthcare, it's, it's not the case in every country. Huh? You have some countries where you still have a direct-to-consumer market, but in those countries where you really have a social security system driven or covered uh, by insurers, I see a very, very, very important role at the healthcare, uh, at the insurance providers. Because Why technically, technically, telemedicine to digital health will or should have an impact on efficiency. And if there is an if impact on efficiency, it should be an impact on costs. And if there is an impact in costs, this cost reduction should be pushed forward to the patients because they pay in the end. So that's the mechanics why I, I think insurance companies, they play a huge role mm -hmm. in, in this industry. So, will, so you said will, savings would eventually or will eventually be passed on to patients. There are... Uh, depending on the healthcare you're in. In Switzerland, they are, because we operate telemedical services in models, what we call alternative insurance models. Mm -hmm. uh, it's technically telemedicine embedded in an insurance model, as such that um, patients, whenever they're sick, 
they have to catch up with the telecom, telemedical doctor mm -hmm. so as a gatekeeper, then do what the telemedical like doctor does. Like you do normally with your GM Yes, like a GP, but GP, in, in, yeah. case, in this case it's not a GP, it's a telemedical doctor. Mm -hmm. And if they do so, they profit from a reduced premium between 15 and 20 percent. So technically, the cost impact is directly given, put forward to the patients in Swiss healthcare environments. Doing this, these systems have been very, very successful. So these, what we call in Switzerland, we call them alternative insurance models. They have been growing heavily throughout the last five years, becoming the most dominant alternative insurance models in Switzerland. Switzerland, of course, we always have the problem that the premiums just continue to rise. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and health insurance is expensive and it's obligatory. Yeah. So it is, it is a challenge to overcome. That's why it's important to know Will it translate to my pocket at the end, you know? To my opinion, it has to. It really has to. Because if there is a profit, if there is a benefit, the patient should benefit from. Not only on the quality side, not only on the patient satisfaction side, because it's available for 24 hours. It's really also on the cost side. And I'm, I'm pushing this a little bit forward, that patients should profit on the cost side. It's a big market. Ken Research um, predicts that telemedicine in Switzerland will reach over 500 million Swiss francs by 2022. But it's also competitive. So who are your competitors? Competitors, Who do you compete with? It's, uh, we do have local competitors in Switzerland. Um, they compete us whenever it comes to telemedicine. But on the digital health environment, when it comes now to data-driven, um, uh, digital health services, Switzerland is too small. We just have 8 million inhabitants. I mean, it's a data-driven thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, to think that out of Switzerland you will become pro predominant player in data-driven medicine, that's naive. That's actually why we started to expand five years ago and we operate internationally. We have teleconsultation center in Abu Dhabi, we have one in India. Uh, we have one on the Philippines, which just recently bought a teleconsultation center in Slovakia, now expanding Germany, Malaysia and Indonesia. So that's actually the way how to have to approach it, because it's a data-driven thing. So therefore our competitors, the real competitors, are not in Switzerland. They're, They're not. the global players, yeah. like we want to be one. How close are you? I think we're amongst, uh, in, in the third, that's leading the game at the moment even though we're coming out of small Switzerland. A lot of stuff comes out of small Switzerland, doesn't it? <laughs> and do you, ever, do, you, um, do you have ever patients or doctors question the safety of this? Like, is it safe? Yes, very important question because, I mean, telemedicine is safe. We, we have been proving this now after 18, 19 years. We have been doing this. It's proven internationally. So treating patients on a distance, as long as you follow guidelines, as long as you're careful, as long as you're professional, it's safe. Now when it comes to digital health, that's really, or to artificial intelligence, that's really one of the key questions. Mm -hmm. um, since you are really data driven mm -hmm. and since you're optimizing components, you really have to focus on the safety of these systems. And that's one of our key issues when we developed the AI system together with IBM, that we have a high, high focus on the safety of this, the, of the algorithm and of the systems. The good thing is, in telemedicine, if the system is not very sure on the decision, mm -hmm. you always have a fallback. You have a teleconsultation. Uh -huh. And it pushes you through on an emergency channel on the tele teleconsultation, and in 10 seconds you have a doctor on the line. So that makes the whole thing very safe. Using telemedicine in the backbone as an existent service you can use in, which is very available. Because one of the things that you are addressing, as I understand it, is a shortage of doctors, right? So um, clearly, you know, as the population all over the world is aging, this becomes more and more of a challenge. Um, how do you, I mean, is this, could this really replace doctors? Uh, it doesn't replace doctors in everything they're doing. Mm. It replaces the doctor in some parts of their job, which is needed. Mm -hmm. And in the future, the doctors, they will not focus on maybe triaging, mm -hmm. because this will be a machine doing it. And they will use their uh, very short resources on those things doctors are really needed. 
So that's, I don't think that this thing or these systems are going to really replace the doctors. It's just changing the way how they're working. We spoke to the FMH, the Swiss Medical Association, uh, about the general area of telemedicine, and they said, of course, it plays an important role, but they highlighted that this is alongside face-to-face -face med medical care, and that it could not compensate for the shortage of doctors, which is why I, <laughs> I posed you that question. I wouldn't agree with FMH, but I don't have to. <laughs> All right, so how would, you how would you persuade doctors and patients that more face-to-face -face, um, consultations could be, in fact, replaced by this technology? I think the major challenge is actually to uh, persuade the patients because the patients are the customers. They're really using it. And uh, this, this is a huge challenge because traditionally um, the interaction between patients and doctor is a physical one. It's in another language. I have to see my doctor when I'm sick. Mm -hmm. The right question would be, I would have to give my doctor enough data that he has to come up with the right decision. So that would be the right thing. Eh? But we, do, we, we think that we have to see a doctor getting physical contact. And I think the major challenge is how do we come up with instruments, with technological instruments that generate um, trust. Mm -hmm. Trust in a way patients really trust the machine in what they're doing. To me, this is the huge, huge challenge. And that's why we're investing a lot in user or customer acceptance. Mm -hmm. How do people interact with this instrument? Mm -hmm. And I think there is a lot, a lot of, the, of these answers are in the application itself. In the app. How, in the app. Mm -hmm. How does it look? How does it come up with but the questions? But you also have to overcome that, that, um, that challenge of I mean, you assume people know how to use the app. You know, you assume that people are, are di the digitalization has reached <laughs> everybody's lives because if they don't have a smartphone and they don't have an app, then they don't have access to your it's technology. It's not only about using, it's about trusting in what the app's telling you. Mm -hmm. And this is another, this is another story. Mm -hmm. when, how, when do you start trusting a machine when it comes to healthcare? And I think this is the big challenge the whole industry have to, has to face. You know? And it's not resolved by, OK, the digital natives, they will do it. <laughs> it's, it's not solved by this. It's, it's really an issue. We have to come up with solutions. Patients trust in. Mm -hmm. It's our job to do so. And it is the future. You think this is the game changer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because in the future, we can't afford healthcare system like we do now. No way. We have to change the way how we're working. And this is a big step now. Because AI and systems, they will help us to do so. They will help us to automize. And it's now the time that we have to start automizing processes in healthcare.